Hi, my name is John Bean. I'm the CEO of Mem Computing, and I'm going to introduce Max Deventer here. He is a professor of physics at UCSD. He's also the co-inventor of the Mem Computing technology and a co-founder of the Mem Computing company. So this is a, a talk that Max has given many times at numerous conferences and uh, really goes into the science behind MEM computing. So we hope that you enjoy it and, and learn something from it. Okay, thank you, John. And uh, let's start. So this talk uh, discusses uh, uh, the physics behind MEM computing. Uh, the word itself means uh, computing with and in memory. And uh, as John was saying, he's, this is work that I've uh, done at UCSD together with uh, uh, Fabio Traverso is now CTO of uh, the company, then Computing Incorporated. Um, you will see also uh, you know, on the left of the screen, uh, you know, some, some uh, references if you're interested in learning more. So this is uh, inspired by the brain and it is topological in the sense that uh, uh, it is very robust against noise and structural disorder. And I will tell you why this is so. And uh, and the idea was taken from, uh, uh, some of the ideas were taken from uh, what we learned from the brain itself, which is the most incredible computing machine. And uh, in fact, it, it uses a very little energy to compute a large number uh, of, to make a large number of operations per second, about 25 watts to perform 10 to the 16 operations per second. And uh, if you try to actually do the same amount of operations uh, on a supercomputer, then it requires it would require uh, orders of magnitude more uh, uh, than uh, 25 watts, uh, and uh, to do just the same number of operations, not even the quality of operations done by the the brain. So uh, in the literature, you actually uh, see a lot of strategies to learn uh, from the brain and try to emulate uh, its main features. And in fact, the majority of people follow one strategy, which is uh, they try to reproduce neurons and synapses uh, in the solid state uh, um, or in simulating them. And then using these uh, um, neurons and synapses, uh, they put them together. And this gives rise to the field of neural networks, which is a, a huge field. And it actually has produced a lot of very interesting um, uh, results. Our approach is totally different. In fact, uh, we uh, don't want to reproduce uh, single neurons and synapses. Uh, and uh, what we want is to reproduce uh, some high level features uh, of the brain and uh, uh, putting them uh, uh, together. And uh, this gives rise to the paradigm we call man computing. So we are not even interested in reproducing how the single neurons work, uh, the, how the synapses work, uh, but just try to get some of the features uh, high-level features that, that the brain uh, um, appears to have uh, and try to reproduce them uh, in the solid state, uh, putting them together and see what happens. In fact, uh, the question we want to answer is, uh, what is the computational power of a machine that has uh, these high-level features of the brain? So how far it can go? So uh, instead of uh, uh, explaining first uh, the, the uh, you know, the method itself, uh, I want to start from uh, results uh, and uh, uh, here I will show you uh, simulations uh, done on a single uh, processor of differential equations. I'll just put them da down here, although you don't need to uh, understand at this point what they mean. They're, these are the equations essentially that represent the uh, electrical circuits that I will show you later. And uh, these have been uh, simulated uh, uh, to find the steady states, uh, uh, the equilibrium points of these uh, uh, ordinary differential equations, and those equilibrium points uh, are uh, represent the solutions to the problem that we want to solve. Now, the simulations that I'm uh, talking about here, um, I will show you here, have been done by uh, a computer scientist at the NSF San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is not related to UCSD, it's an independent uh, uh, center. Uh, using a MATLAB uh, code that uh, simulates those uh, uh, equations, and all the results have been run on a single Intel Xeon processor without optimization. So let me start from a, a well-known MP-complete problem uh, that is called the subset sum problem, where you have uh, a set of uh, integers, uh, um, let's say five, and uh, another integer, uh, let's say S, and you want to ask the question, is there a subset of those integers that sums to S? Uh, 
either you answer yes or no, or uh, you can ask, uh, if you do the search version of this uh, NP complete problem, uh, you can ask uh, uh, which subset, if it exists, actually sums to us. Now, when the number of elements in this set uh, is equal to the number of bits representing uh, those elements, then there is no pseudo polynomial solution to this problem. And in fact, uh, you see this here, uh, the standard algorithm uh, would explode exponentially. And uh, if you look at, <clears throat> at the bottom in, the, in blue, you will start, you see already uh, the simulations are done using our approach. And in fact, uh, if you go to um, about uh, 50 uh, elements uh, equal to 50 per, uh, in number of uh, bits per element, then uh, the standard approach would take about four and a half years and it took two days to actually solve this. And if you go to about uh, uh, 60 or so, uh, the standard approach would take over 2000 years uh, and it would take uh, uh, about four and a half days uh, using our simulations. Uh, this is an NP complete problem. What about the uh, NP hard problems uh, where we cannot guarantee the, uh, the solution? We can only ask uh, certain questions regarding um, yeah, approximations to the, to the optimum. So an NP hard problem is a, a problem where you are, you have a, a formula, a Boolean formula with the several variables, x1, y1 example, related to each other with the logical or and with conjunctions, logical ends. And you're asking here the question, uh, what is the maximum number of satisfied clauses uh, uh, of this formula or equivalently, um, can you minimize the number of unsatisfied clause, clauses? Now, for these type of problems, uh, and these are NP-hard problems, uh, all of them, by the way, can be written in this form, which is called the conjunctive normal form. Uh, you can only ask uh, uh, a certain approximation to the optimum. We, we don't know, in fact, what is the optimum. But even if you try to get uh, a better approximation um, to whatever you found, then you, uh, it turns out that uh, you have to um, uh, spend uh, you know exponential time to do this this is uh, visible um, in this plot where we actually uh, compare the with the winners of uh, the 2016 matsap competition and you have uh, in fact uh, on the uh, left in blue red two uh, of the winners of that competition and there uh, uh, i mean they actually uh, the time to actually improve on their solutions explodes exponentially for the problems that we looked at. In black, you, uh, uh, the black stars, you see our uh, approach. And in fact, uh, we could push it to uh, millions of variables uh, in linear time, uh, while the best solver stops uh, at about a few thousands of uh, variables. And uh, if you extrapolate those uh, uh, standard solvers, in fact, uh, um, the, it, it takes about 20, 500, uh, 5,000 orders of magnitude, the age of the universe. And the best one actually takes about 2,400 orders of magnitude of the age of the universe if uh, you push those solvers uh, to go to the 2 million variables that we actually did. While we, our results actually have been done in about two hours using MATLAB on a single processor. Remember that those solvers have been written in combined languages while ours is in MATLAB. Uh, in fact, the, the limitation for our approach is not even the time, but the memory required to uh, uh, solve these problems. So here is an example where we push the, uh, uh, the max set of, uh, problem for hard instances uh, up to 64 million variables, uh, which is about 300 million clauses in this case, uh, and about uh, uh, a billion literals. And the problem here is uh, that we had to stop there, not because of time, but because the memory um, requirement, so we, which scales linearly, but the processor we used uh, had a, a, a most 128 gigabytes. So we had to stop at that point. So uh, we have uh, other results. I don't have time to, uh, to show them. Uh, we have results on spin glasses, uh, Kubo problems, uh, and acceleration of uh, uh, deep learning. Um, I will not discuss those uh, because I want to say um, something about how is that possible? How can we actually uh, solve uh, complex problems, uh, uh, hard problems uh, so, uh, so efficiently? In a uh, software, by the way, we haven't even built these machines yet. So I will uh, uh, tell you which features of the brain we are actually trying to emulate. 
And then uh, uh, this leads me to the definition of a new class of machines uh, that Fabio and I uh, introduced, which is uh, which we call the universal and computer machines. And then uh, I will show, instead of showing you the math, uh, uh, which is in fact not that simple, it is a bit complex, I will show you, uh, I will guide you through examples. Uh, I will start with prime factorization and then uh, um, the NP hard, NP complete and hard problems that in fact I already showed you. Using, by the way, digital non-computing machines. By digital, we mean that those machines uh, map uh, integers or a set of uh, uh, a finite set of, of elements into a finite set of elements. So, integers into integers. And then I'll tell you that uh, uh, these machines actually use uh, what in physics we call instantons, which are classical trajectories that connect critical points in the phase space. And uh, uh, this is not a trivial thing because uh, the presence of these instantons means that the machines uh, have long range order, uh, which means they can correlate uh, um, anywhere in space uh, and in fact also in time, which is in fact critical for their uh, success in solving these problems efficiently. So let's start from how the brain actually computes, uh, uh, or at least the, the features that we think that could be um, used in our machines. So here is an, uh, uh, um, the imaging of the brain. It's a movie showing the imaging of the, of the brain, uh, where you see um, this is a piece of, uh, uh, of course, of um, uh, new, uh, I mean, a slice of neurons, of uh, uh, the neurons all over the place. If you look both, you will see that when the one neuron, let's say on the left uh, bottom corner, um, fires, and then there, is, there are other neurons that fire, as, fire at the same time, actually very far away. In fact, that you can show that there is a, a, a scalability in the interaction between the, the correlations between firing on neurons at different points in space. Here is, uh, uh, these are results uh, uh, taken using fMRI. And if you look at uh, the firing of the neurons uh, everywhere, uh, you know, in this uh, uh, part of the cortex, you would expect that since it's a classical system that uh, the correlations will decay exponentially fast, but in, re in reality they decay, as you see in the plots, uh, um, as a power law, which uh, uh, in physics uh, uh, we, we associate generally to phase transitions. We know that phase transitions have this type of uh, um, uh, power laws, although uh, power laws uh, are not necessarily uh, a signature of a phase transition. Now, these results have been uh, realized uh, in other have been verified in other contexts here is uh, uh, on the right you have uh, <clears throat> neurons are put on top of the electrodes and by exciting one electrode uh, let's say you look at the excitation of the neuron um, uh, by exciting a neuron uh, uh, you know with the, the help of one electrode you would excite neurons in other parts of the system and again uh, you see that the decay of the correlations is a scale free this means that the neurons actually uh, communicate at very long distances so this is what uh, long range order uh, means. So this is an interesting feature that we would like to have uh, in our machines because it means that uh, the machine can actually operate by co uh, communicating at very long distances and allowing the system actually to uh, communicate at very long distances. So the other feature that we know about the brain is that uh, the computation and the storing are done on the same physical platform. There is no se separation of tax between the CPU and the memory as we have in, uh, in our uh, present machines. And uh, uh, there is another feature, however, that is very interesting, which is intrinsic parallelism, which means that unlike what we have nowadays where the CPUs, uh, even for parallel machines where you have, let's say, four CPUs, uh, uh, each one with uh, their own memory or sharing memory, uh, uh, when you actually uh, um, run a code on a parallel machine like that, uh, each CPU will perform uh, its own tasks uh, and they will only communicate at the end of the cycle. But during the, the computation, they actually don't know each other. They don't know what the others are doing. This is totally different than what uh, uh, um, we call intrinsic parallelism. By intrinsic parallelism, we, we mean that uh, um, uh, all units uh, or a large part of the units uh, will actually operate on all data or parts of the data at the same time. This is in fact how neurons operate, that you have a collection of data that, and a collection of neurons and the neurons uh, collectively um, operate on all the data at the same time. Another feature that uh, uh, we learned from uh, neuroscience we don't, um, that we call information overhead that actually can, can be explained much easier with an example. 
here is, a, a, let's say, a set of resistors um, in series, uh, connected in series. And uh, suppose you uh, want to store, uh, let's say, uh, information on each one of them. Suppose they have memory. Um, this is uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, you would do if the uh, the resistors were separate, but the resistors actually uh, tie together. And in fact, uh, there is uh, information already in the uh, topology, in this case, in the architecture linear, in this case, uh, uh, of the connectivity between the resistors. In what sense? Suppose you actually uh, bias uh, these resistors, then uh, uh, and you had a device, uh, uh, let's say an ammeter, that measures uh, uh, the current or voltage across uh, uh, three resistors, then you would also have access uh, uh, to the sum of those resistors. And if you repeat it uh, uh, with uh, any other possible combination of all resistors uh, uh, together, then you have access uh, to all possible sums uh, of uh, those uh, resistances. So in reality, you have uh, a quadratic information overhead, which means that you have uh, access uh, to more computations uh, than the simple sum uh, of the units you have. Of course, in this particular example, uh, uh, you uh, you see that you need uh, external devices to actually measure these uh, uh, these extra uh, you know calculations. But if you actually uh, uh, can devise uh, easily um, can devise uh, an, an architecture that uh, exploits this thing, then you would have uh, more information that uh, the machine can actually tap into to actually compute efficiently. So is there a, a new computing paradigm that uses uh, the features that I told you before? Let's say uh, it has long range order, uh, uh, memory uh, does both tasks, uh, you have intrinsic parallelism, information on head. Well, uh, we, we uh, there is, uh, and uh, uh, provided, uh, as I said, the memory does uh, uh, the whole work. So the memory no longer um, is used only for uh, storage, but actually it's used also to do computation. Now, this is uh, not just uh, uh, in theory, but in fact, uh, in physics, we know that any physical system subject to a perturbation will always uh, show memory. In fact, uh, memory means locality. It means that the system, uh, the property of the system at a given time, it depends uh, on the past uh, dynamics uh, of the system itself. Now, the question is how... Uh, easy it is to measure that memory in terms of, uh, of the frequency at which you would have to actually operate to see this memory. But in reality, any physical system uh, has memory because uh, uh, any physical system uh, cannot respond instantaneously to an external perturbation. In fact, uh, you can write uh, any uh, uh, physical uh, system uh, subject to a, an input the u of t and uh, giving out an output y of t as a nonlinear response function that depends uh, on the input itself, u, and possibly on internal uh, degrees of freedom, a set of sta state variables that actually follow their own equation of motion. Any physical system, whether it's passive or active, can be written this way. And nowadays we call uh, memristors those that uh, uh, have input and output of voltages and uh, currents, so the response function would be a memristance or resistance with memory. Or we call uh, mem capacitors uh, those that have uh, input and output uh, charge and voltage, uh, and the capacitance uh, uh, with memory uh, is the mem capacitance. And uh, uh, flux and current uh, uh, are related uh, in an inductance that has memory. We call these uh, devices mem inductors. However, as I said, uh, this is much more general because any physical system can be written in the way I just wrote above. Now, the advantage of these things is that uh, when you bias them, uh, and let's say periodically at an appropriate uh, frequency and appropriate uh, amplitude, uh, the, um, let's say in this case, the charge voltage, voltage relation, so I'm looking at a mem capacitor, should, would show hysteresis uh, with, an, uh, with a maximum uh, hysteresis according to uh, the frequency and amplitude you use uh, to bias the system. This is because, uh, you know, a certain frequencies uh, uh, the internal degrees of freedom are not able to follow easily the external input, and so they will lag behind literally and show the hysteresis. Now, you see immediately they can use a curve like that already as a um, uh, logical device, uh, where in the lower part of the curve you would, uh, let's say, stop and represent that with a zero, or in the top part you would represent it with a one at a given voltage, 
or you can use the entire analog feature of, uh, of this hysteresis. So this leads me to a, uh, the concept, the general concept we call mem computing machines, uh, universal mem computing machines uh, that employ in fact memory to do both tasks. In fact, uh, uh, unlike uh, the, the standard architecture uh, where memory is separate from the CPU, we say that apart from an input and an output and a control unit, which is there to tell the machine what type of operations, what type of program to execute, then the memory does everything. We call that a computational memory or mem processors. And uh, uh, this is like a neural network where you have uh, the control unit tells the machine <clears throat> what type of operations to execute. You have uh, the state that is distributed over a network of mem processors. And then through a transition function, you would have actually a new state, which is also uh, um, stored directly in the in the units themselves. But unlike uh, uh, standard neural networks, as I told you, um, uh, our machines have information overhead. So the topology will be uh, tailored to the specific problem to solve. So machine, universal and community machines in words are simply objects that compute with any memory and can be uh, defined as digital or analog or both. Now, what I will show you later are the digital versions of these machines, which means that they map integers into integers. Why? Because we want them to be scalable easily. And if you have input and output that require uh, only finite uh, precision, then this can be done uh, quite easily, which is the same thing we use in our standard the machines, which are based on the Turing paradigm. Now, of course, these are just words, but you can formalize this, this concept if you're interested uh, at the bottom of the of the slide you have the paper. And uh, the, uh, the, need, the need to formalize this mathematically is precisely because we want to prove the theorem. So, but I won't go through this uh, step by step, it would take too long. So is this uh, uh, only math or you can actually realize these things uh, in practice? And what do we need to actually make this uh, a real practical and importantly scalable uh, um, paradigm? As I told you, we need the input and output to be digital. We don't care what uh, happens in between because that's what the physics does, but at least the input and the output have, have to be um, digital. The reason, as I said, is because we don't want to have problems with precision and we want machines uh, uh, so we, we can actually build machines that are scalable. And the last uh, feature is that we want to uh, be able to uh, fabricate them uh, uh, with present technology. We don't want to wait 100 years uh, to actually make these devices. And so uh, what I will show you is, in fact, a non-quantum realization of these uh, uh, machines uh, where quantum mechanics, uh, if at all, enters only in uh, how, let's say, the materials uh, uh, operate, but definitely not in the global uh, um, uh, machine. So no quantum entanglement and no quantum tunneling and so forth. So instead of going through the theorems, uh, I will uh, guide you through uh, uh, some examples. I will start with the prime factorization and I'll show you how we actually implement these things in practice. So suppose you want to factorize uh, an integer n into two primes, uh, p and q. Suppose uh, uh, that n can be factorized only in two primes. Uh, according to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, so you know that there is only one way to do that, but it could be with three more primes, it doesn't matter. Let's suppose this is uh, only factorizable with two primes. And, let, and let's write those primes uh, into a uh, 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 digital, uh, sorry, bit, bit format. So nj, pj, and qj represent, uh, represent the zeros and ones uh, of the numbers n, p, and q. And if you multiply p times q, then you have the remainders. This is standard arithmetics uh, only for a binary <coughs> representation. But if you look carefully, the uh, remainders are sums and products of the p and q's that represent uh, the numbers. But in logical format, the sums can be written as exclusive ors and the products uh, can be written as uh, logical ends. So I can write the entire uh, multiplication between uh, these, uh, these numbers uh, as a logical Boolean circuit. This is in fact how it is done nowadays in our standard uh, digital computers. So uh, you would have, uh, let's say uh, for this number 35, uh, uh, you would have a Q0 times P0 times P1 
plus q1 times q0 and so forth until you get uh, uh, to the number n that you um, want to factorize. Now, this is how a, a standard a digital machine like the one I'm using to project would uh, actually do it. What we want is actually the reverse <clears throat> to give uh, a number n and then get the numbers p and q. Now, by looking at this graph, you realize immediately that if you had the standard logic gates, this cannot be done because standard logic gates can only uh, um, accept the inputs and give out uh, an output. But if you want to actually go from the bottom to the edges of this uh, circuit, then you need to have a logic gates that adapt irrespective of what input or output you have. In other words, irrespective of where the signal uh, um, goes in terms of the terminals of these gates. So, uh, uh, first of all, let's notice that any combinatorial optimization problem can be written as a Boolean circuit. In fact, that this circuit is not even unique. So what we will do is uh, use those same circuits, which are given to us uh, uh, by mathematicians or computer scientists. Uh, but uh, as I said, we cannot use the standard gates. So we actually invent new types of gates. So in standard uh, logic, you have uh, gates, this is a, a representation of an end, uh, where you have only inputs, you give uh, inputs and you get an output. This is it. In fact, even uh, um, for parallel machines, uh, uh, you have the same thing. So you give a set of inputs and the outputs will, will go into the next set of the logic gates until you get uh, the solution. This is how you would do standard uh, computing with our standard uh, machines. But if you have extra degrees of freedom, in this case, uh, uh, or memory, time and locality, you can actually invent a new type of logic that we call self-organizing. Because uh, uh, in this case, uh, suppose this is an end, if you give uh, B1 equal to 1 and B2 equal to 1, then you would get B0 equal to 1. But if, if I actually give a B0 equal to 1, I can actually devise uh, um, a, a device uh, that actually can self-organize into giving me out uh, b1 equal to 1 and b2 equal to 2 uh, to, uh, b2 equal to 1 sorry uh, and if i actually have b0 equal to 0 uh, i can be advising in such a way that it gives me out the three possibility uh, possibilities 1 0 and 0 1 and 0 0 and which one will be chosen it depends on the initial conditions of, of um, the device itself and the environment in which it is uh, um, put. So in fact, if you put these self-organizing logic gates uh, together, then they will try to satisfy each other uh, um, their respective logical propositions. So the only thing we care about is that they satisfy their logical proposition and, and nothing else, irrespective of where the signal is coming. And then we, uh, we give it as inputs, uh, um, inputs as specific uh, terminals of the circuit and read the output uh, uh, as a, the steady state equilibrium uh, position of the circuit as some particular uh, terminals. Now you can define, uh, you can devise these uh, uh, self-organizing logic gates uh, using, for example, memory source like we have, I have it on the right side, uh, uh, and and or combinations of the, uh, transistors. And these devices actually uh, operate both ways. As I told you, they can uh, get uh, inputs of zeros and ones from any terminal, and then they will adapt to satisfy the logical uh, table that are meant to uh, represent, nothing else. Now, uh, in practice, uh, as I already anticipated, we use, uh, uh, let's say, uh, memory stores or um, resistors with memory or trans and or transistors. So we are actually working with the um, circuits. The circuits are represented mathematically with uh, uh, nonlinear differential equations where the, um, you have X is uh, the current, the voltages, internal states uh, uh, of the memory. And in nonlinear dynamics, you know that uh, given an initial condition, the system can actually end up into several um, solutions. Uh, so the equilibrium points, uh, which are the easiest one uh, uh, of that equation, but actually the system can end up into a linear cycle where it will never stop, or worse, it can actually end up into a, a strange attractor or chaotic behavior, show chaotic behavior. Now, if we represent the solution of the problem at hand, at hand with the equilibrium points of the nonlinear differential equations of these circuits, then we need to guarantee that there is uh, there are no linear cycles and no chaos in the system in the, when equilibrium are, are present. 
Now we can do this because uh, uh, by designing those circuits, we can prove uh, a very important uh, feature that mathematicians call point dissipative uh, uh, property of dynamical systems. And it means uh, simply that there is uh, the system ends up always uh, in a global attractor. So the orbits are always bounded. This feature is not uh, general. In fact, it's not easy to design uh, dynamical systems with these properties. Uh, uh, like we did, and for example, constrained neural networks do not satisfy this hypothesis. That's why you actually have other features that are not easy to control. But in our case, our circuits are uh, point dissipative. And again, by point dissipative, we mean only that there is a global attractor. Irrespective of the initial condition, the system will always go to a global now, this would not be enough. In fact, uh, uh, we need to prove also that uh, uh, the solutions of the problem we're looking at uh, are the only uh, uh, represented by only equilibrium points. So in other words, uh, the only equilibrium points are the solutions of the problem. And we actually prove this as well. And again, this is not enough uh, uh, because if, uh, for example, the equilibrium points are reached uh, too slowly, then uh, uh, this would be a useless uh, uh, type of uh, approach, uh, but in reality, we can prove that the equilibrium points can be reached exponentially fast. And uh, importantly, we can actually uh, prove that the convergence uh, rate uh, scales at most polynomially with size, which means that by increasing the size of the problem, the resources in time, energy, and, uh, and the space uh, required to solve the problem are only polynomial. And finally, uh, if there are equilibrium points, we can prove that there are no limit cycles uh, coexisting with the, with the solutions. And we can prove all these things using, we proved all these things using function analysis. At the bottom, you will see the papers if you're interested in the theorems. And uh, uh, we can prove also that if there are equilibrium points, there is no chaos. And we can prove this uh, using topology. Again, the papers below uh, are referred to the demonstrations of these theorems. Okay, so we have actually a mathematical proof of all these features. Uh, and so how do we solve a particular problem? Suppose you want to solve the traveling salesman. Well, uh, you select the, the problem first, and then you write it in binary representation. As I said, this is a, a standard way. Uh, um, it can be done in standard ways. Um, and in fact, it's not even unique, the way in which you map a, a given problem into its Boolean format. But we replace those circuits with our self-organizing logic circuits, uh, logic gates. And, uh, and this is uh, the critical um, feature because then we simulate or you build these devices. Again, since these are made of uh, standard uh, electronic devices or um, with or without memory, then you can either fabricate these things or you can simulate the, uh, the corresponding ordinary differential equations. And then we look to the, uh, the equilibrium points or steady state solutions, and these are the solutions to the problem at hand. So these are the equations uh, uh, that uh, I showed you at the very beginning. Now you should understand that these represent the voltages, uh, currents, internal states uh, of all the devices uh, that represent the circuits uh, uh, representing the problem we want to solve. And as I said, we implemented so far these, these equations are using MATLAB. Uh, code, um, not even parallel, um, and uh, we look for the steady state solutions. Here is a, a, a real space representation of uh, factorization, a much larger version of what I showed you before. It's uh, 11 bits. The number is 1073. We start from initial conditions which are random because uh, we know that the system will always go to um, the global attractor. And then uh, the dots here, white or black, uh, are the zeros and ones uh, representing uh, the uh, terminals of the self-organizing gates you have in the circuit. And the circles represent uh, uh, the input. So the zeros and ones uh, that will uh, represent the number 1073 uh, that we want to factorize. Now, uh, here we literally simulate all the voltages and currents in the circuit, uh, so implementing Kirchhoff's laws and so forth. Uh, and then we switch on the biases uh, at the circles representing the zeros and ones of the number 1073. And then we let the system uh, self-organize uh, into the solution. And you see, in fact, that, that the, the, the gates will try to satisfy uh, each other uh, until the, the solution is uh, uh, read uh, a steady state from uh, appropriate uh, um, terminals. Now, here are all the voltages at all the uh, terminals uh, for a very small uh, 
numbers of uh, bits up to 18 bits uh, and you see that in fact uh, uh, at the at the beginning the voltages uh, are smooth and then you see these uh, huge spikes of voltages and then the system goes to equilibrium if you implemented circuit uh, the hardware uh, it will scale uh, quadratically with the number of uh, bits in both uh, uh, time energy and, and space and uh, uh, we are, what if uh, the system has a, uh, has no solution? Suppose we want to factorize a number which is already prime, number 47. Well, due to scalability, we know when sh the system, uh, the machine should stop. It should stop about uh, here, about uh, the unit one, around the unit one of time, but it will go on uh, forever. In fact, we can prove that this is uh, a limit cycle with a, uh, a possibly very large uh, period, which makes it essentially indistinguishable from a chaotic behavior. So what about the subset problem I showed you before? Well, we actually have a similar uh, result. So you can build a circuit which is uh, similar to the one I showed uh, for factorization. And again, for the hardest po uh, case possible when, possible, when the number of elements is equal to the precision, then you see that the voltages are smooth, and then you have these spikes, and then the system goes to a steady state. And again, if you build these things in hardware and with this uh, two-dimensional uh, topology, then the, uh, the scalability would be quadratic in the number of elements and quadratic in the number of bits per element. And the, here is uh, the bot that I showed at the very beginning, and these are the simulations of those circuits of brute force, I mean, by just looking at the steady state of the, those circuits. And for, uh, for the um, MaxSat, actually, we can build a circuit that is linear in the in the gates, and that's why we have actually linear uh, scaling in the number of variables uh, in the system. And uh, this I already showed, and as you can see, in fact, on the left you have the the CLS, which is one of the best solvers existing. It will explode explodes really exponentially. Ours actually scales linearly up to sixty four million variables. So what's really happening? I mean, uh, how is it possible that uh, uh, we have a non-quantum system that is able to solve very complex problems uh, very efficiently? Since it's a non-quantum system, we can actually simulate it uh, in uh, software, unlike uh, what you can do with a quantum computer. So in other words, uh, how is it possible that a machine like this uh, is able to correlate the gates uh, uh, very far away? Why I'm saying this because uh, you immediately recognize that uh, in order for a machine to actually efficiently solve uh, a problem like a Boolean problem like the ones that I showed before, it, it, it requires uh, all the gates uh, to know what the other gates uh, are doing. In other words, uh, each gate has to be correlated uh, to all the other gates because if it needs uh, a zero or one to satisfy its uh, own logical proposition, it requires uh, uh, other gates uh, anywhere in the circuit to actually give it to, to this particular gate uh, the zero and one that it needs. Uh, so you see, in fact, uh, as I said, uh, a smooth behavior at the very beginning, and then uh, all of a sudden the gates cannot satisfy each other uh, locally. The connections are only local. There is no long range of uh, connections. Um, and, but they will actually create uh, these spikes. So what are these spikes? Uh, if I look at the one case here is a factorization of 20 bits, and I look at one of those spikes, uh, Actually, if I look at uh, the correlation of uh, uh, a gate uh, to any other gate uh, in the circuit, you see that the correlation is flat until uh, you reach the border of, of the circuit. This is an ideal scale-free situation, similar to what the brain does, but instead of decaying with uh, some power, it actually is completely flat, which is even better than what the brain uh, has as a scale-free property. Uh, we can actually prove this mathematically, I won't go into the details, uh, uh, by writing those equations uh, um, in general form and by adding noise. We add noise uh, only because we want to show that these are actually robust against noise and structural disorder. But you can write this, th these equations in a path integral representation and uh, the, uh, without going into the details, uh, this, uh, this path integral representation shows that uh, these uh, machines uh, uh, can be written in what we call in physics a topological field theory, uh, which has a particular, uh, in fact, action and uh, has a particular supersymmetry and so forth. So I won't go into these details, but the important thing is that in these type of theories, uh, there is uh, one concept uh, that we call instanton, which uh, uh, is very important. In fact, uh, instantons are the equivalent of tunneling, but in Euclidean space. 
And uh, instantons connect uh, critical points, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a saddle point or you know, local minimum and so forth, uh, to other critical points uh, that are different, topologically different, with lower uh, uh, index. So it, the machine, in fact, uh, can tunnel literally, uh, um, or between quotes, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the huge, uh, humongous space space uh, uh, from one point to the other uh, when it finds, it tries to find the solution. In fact, we can compute this analytically, and we can show that these uh, uh, instantons, uh, in fact, uh, um, are uh, give rise to long-range order in space and also in time. Now, the easiest analogy I can think of is the one of a pinball, where you try to uh, you take the pinball and you actually put it flat, uh, so you avoid gravity, and you want to move a ball from one uh, point, uh, um, from one from the entrance to exit point. And if you don't have gravity, then uh, you would have to actually explore the entire uh, phase space. So this is uh, what annealing does, uh, essentially. It's an exponent exponential search. But if you actually use gravity to your advantage, so you flip it as we, we do it in this game, then uh, the, the ball will scatter through the, uh, the centers, but in polynomial time will actually find the exit, thanks to... Uh, in fact, the gravity, the pushes. Gravity for us are the voltages that we apply at the input to drive the system to equilibrium. So that is the analogy. And uh, uh, the, the dots in here are the critical points in the phase space, while the, uh, the trajectories in between those dots are what we call instantons uh, in uh, physics. Okay, so what is really happening? Well, uh, there is uh, the machine at the beginning starts uh, smoothly. Uh, the, the gates will try to satisfy uh, their logical proposition locally, but then they realize that they cannot do it, uh, and then they will have to correlate uh, anywhere in the system to actually satisfy uh, their logical propositions. And these spikes uh, are precisely those instantons, or classical, if you want, tunneling, in the humongous space space, uh, which uh, uh, allows the machine to actually correlate the long range. Okay, so I hope I uh, discussed, uh, um, uh, I mean, it was uh, clear enough what we, uh, what these machines uh, can do and how they do it. So we, I discussed the concept of the universal and computing machines, which can compute the complex problems very efficiently. And this uh, uh, is true, um, uh, not just uh, in hardware, but since these are non-quantum machines that are represented by ordinary differential equations, they can actually be implemented, um, simulated in software, something you cannot do with a quantum computer. I uh, showed you specific problems uh, and so specific topologies, but you actually have, uh, you can actually use uh, um, other types of technology like FPGAs or uh, other uh, means to actually uh, change the architecture on the fly to change the type of problem you execute uh, rather than having a specific topology for a specific problem. Now, the interesting thing is that from a fundamental point of view, this uh, shows another uh, relation between topology and computing. Other than uh, quantum computing, there is a big deal nowadays on topological quantum computation precisely because topological means that the machines are robust against noise and disorder. And we have a similar thing here. In fact, uh, I didn't show this, but if you perturb the machines, uh, uh, you will, they will always find the solution. So the trajectories uh, um, could be different, uh, but the solutions will always, always be found. And uh, as you can imagine, then we can apply these things to a lot of our problems, uh, and essentially any problem in computing from big data to low power computing, machine learning, we have now uh, results on uh, accelerating um, training of the, uh, restricted Boltzmann, for example, you can do real-time computing and support, or you can actually learn something possibly about the brain itself. So with this, uh, I thank my collaborators, uh, Fabio Traversa, and my students, of course, Sheldon uh, Heike Manuken and Schomburg Birdin, uh, John for the support, and thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you very much, Max. We will now go through the questions that we've been sent, and we'll give you a chance to respond to those. It's okay, so how does this type of memory and non locality long range order compare to the long range quantum internal quantum theory? That's a very good question. In fact, it is very similar in a classical sense. So, without going into the details of uh, 
of topological field theory, uh, you, since you can write uh, uh, these uh, uh, the equations of motion of these machines uh, in a topological uh, uh, field theory format, uh, like it's written uh, here on the on the screen, then uh, we know that uh, uh, these these things will have long range order on instantons, and in fact uh, that long range order is, uh, as I said, uh, similar to the quantum entanglement. Um, the long range order in this uh, in this case, which is classical, is essentially the equivalent of the quantum tunneling. If I actually uh, transform this into Minkowski space, then I would get a quantum tunneling matrix elements. So we don't need to because we work only in Euclidean space. But this is essentially the same thing. So the the um, we don't need the quantum entanglement, of course, in these machines. But there is uh, some form of a long range order, as I showed. In fact, it's. Uh, 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 Flat, right? So the correlations uh, don't decay essentially uh, until you reach the, the edges, and this is uh, a type of entanglement between quotes in a classical system. So you mentioned deep learning. Can you talk about how many computing applies? Yes. <clears throat> so we actually uh, um, use the um, accelerated uh, um, the training of uh, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. Unfortunately, I don't have the slide with me here. But essentially, uh, the, the, the point is uh, using, um, uh, taking the, the cost function, the energy essentially, right? Uh, writing into uh, a Kubo format, format, then we can actually use uh, the same approach to look for an approximation to the optimal. And that uh, uh, accelerates enormously the uh, training of uh, a restricted Boltzmann machine. In fact, uh, by uh, comparing it with the D wave, uh, which is a $15 million machine uh, in hardware, we are um, uh, better than what uh, uh, these guys can do. So we can actually pre-train uh, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines uh, uh, as fast, if not faster, and definitely with better quality than what D-Wave has shown uh, in, uh, his, his, uh, in, in their uh, uh, plots and, and their papers. So this is what we've done so far, and uh, uh, in fact, that there will be a paper coming out and possibly even another webinar how does a beginner in quantum mechanics with a significant knowledge, with significant knowledge on the master device physics move on to main computer? Uh, <clears throat> well, the best way would be to uh, read uh, our papers, uh, I would say, right? Uh, so you can start reading our papers. Of course, uh, some of them are extremely technical because we needed to prove uh, theorems. Uh, there is a, a paper I can uh, suggest, which is, uh, let me see if I can find it again. It's a very simple, it's a, uh, um, how do I so it's a Scientific American where we explain uh, in general terms uh, the idea behind computing. Uh, we are writing another perspective, invited perspective on this, which uh, will be much simpler than what we have in the technical papers. But I would suggest starting from our papers and, uh, and go from there and send us uh, emails if you don't understand something. Okay, here's another one. Um, can a self-organizing logic circuits be used for sequential finite state machines such, such as control units that automatic? Uh, and in this, unfortunately, I don't have enough knowledge about uh, automatic control units. I would uh, suspect it does, uh, but uh, honestly, I cannot answer uh, with knowledge about this question. We really, we really need a yeah. computer, yeah. computer to do these things. Uh, are self-organizing logic gates instantons essentially similar to entangled qubits? Yes, this is a similar um, question that I answered already before. Uh, yeah, the, the instantons uh, uh, provide the, uh, the long range order, which is similar to the entanglement that you have uh, in qubits. Uh, entanglement is a, uh, uh, is a, is a, um, uh, rigidity essentially of the system, right? Uh, if you perturb the system in one part and the system is entangled, then it will, uh, the perturbation will be felt uh, uh, far away. So similar is, uh, uh, that's the same thing we have here. So you perturb, uh, uh, let's say, the system in one part and it will be correlated uh, long range. Long range. Yeah,
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. Somebody asked me something else here. Um, yeah, in uh, in uh, the great advantage is that uh, again, uh, in a quantum computer, you cannot scale these things easily. In fact, uh, as far as I know, there are only few uh, bits, um, like quantum computers that can entangle very few bits for very short time, uh, on the order of tens. Tens. Uh, clearly, this is a classical machine, so you can actually create a long range order, as you saw uh, on uh, millions or billions of uh, literals. So, it's a huge difference. Okay, another question. Uh, can you review in the MATLAB simulation how memory is scaled with input size for the three SATA subsets and problem you solved? Yes, so as, uh, as I showed you here, this is uh, linear for the max SAT. So uh, the memory does not uh, explode. In fact, in fact uh, since we're uh, solving differential equations, it scales linearly with the uh, input size. As I showed you here, this is uh, the limit here is really the memory of the processor that you use. So the memory scales linearly up to the uh, 128 gigs that was uh, our, uh, the memory of this Intel Xeon. So the memory is really not an issue. Um, sorry, the, the time is not an issue. It's the memory of the processor. Of course, you can uh, uh, use a shared memory so you can actually make this even bigger. And probably by uh, you know optimizing the code, you would actually be able to scale even more than 64 million variables. Note again that uh, uh, we, in this type of problems, we reach the uh, cases that are uh, unimaginable with standard approaches, where they stop, uh, let's say, a few thousand variables, while we can go to millions of variables in a few hours. Is example MATLAB code available? Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 if you pay, yes. <laughs> uh, no, we will not give it out, uh, of course. Uh, we are um, transferring it uh, into SAS, uh, Software as a Service, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, when this is done, we'll give out uh, um, free time for testing, but then it will be, of course, uh, you will have to pay. All right. Thank you, everyone. That is it for the question.